climate and conflict rising to the challenges of a disrupted world. I'm Liz Hume. I'm the executive director of the Alliance for Peacebuilding, and we are so grateful that you're here with us today. I first want to start off and say thank you to our partner, the U.S. Institute of Peace, Lise Grand, and her amazing staff who worked so closely with us to make this all happen. Uh, I first want to also talk about the title, PeaceCon, COVID, Climate, and Conflict, Rising to the Challenges of a Disrupted World. I want people to know that when we think about uh, this conference and start working on it, this is always the hardest thing to do is to come up with this title. I want to give a big shout out to Alan Fitz, one of our board members at the Alliance for Peace Building. This title seems so obvious, but it wasn't. Um, we do it almost a year in advance, and we have to think about where we're going. Um, and I think the disrupted world captures what we're gonna be talking about a lot um, over the next few days. I want to acknowledge that, uh, unfortunately, we were so hopeful this year that we would be able to get together in some form in person. I, you know, it is weird to look out into this great hall at the at USIP and not see our colleagues, our friends, the peace building community. And I want to acknowledge how much we miss that. But I also know that we've learned so much about how important it is to have this connection also um, through these uh, electronic platforms and how next year, we're hopeful, when everyone can have a vaccine and testing, that we can be together again, but know that we've learned how important this hybrid model is as well to make sure that we can connect globally. But this year, we're celebrating PeaceCon at 10. So a lot of people have asked me what that at 10 means. It's 10 years of this conference and this partnership with USIP. For those of you who don't know the history of AFP, it started about two decades ago with a small group of practitioners who came together to develop a community of practice for peace building and conflict prevention. The first conference, I'm told, was just a small retreat. Fast forward two decades later, AFP is a robust network of 160 organizational members working in 181 countries globally. Now when we say the word peace building, people in other development sectors, policymakers, lawmakers globally don't look at us and say, what exactly is that? And I know right now everyone's going through their mind a conversation they had where they've had to explain what peace building is. But today, peace building can be found in US laws, including the Women Peace um, uh, Law, the Global Fragility Act, uh, the UN Sustaining Peace Agenda, the World Bank's Fragility Strategy. Rob Jenkins will be here um, this afternoon to talk about USAID's new bureau, the Conflict Prevention and Stabilization Bureau at USAID. We've come a long way. However, we have a long way to go. We have a lot of work to do. We've hit a 30-year high in global violent conflict. We have a global violent conflict problem. COVID is stabilization in reverse. Climate change is compounding conflict. But we don't have to accept that conflict is inevitable. Violent conflict is inevitable. And this robust, committed, and growing community proves that. I'm excited for my new role as executive director, and I'm so grateful for the board at the Alliance for Peace Building, who has the trust in me and for all of you that have worked so hard with us to develop our new strategy moving forward, our field building strategy. You'll hear a lot about it throughout the next couple days. We're gonna be continuing to develop an evidence base, advocating for game-changing policies and laws, and making sure that they're implemented successfully, accelerating collective action, and tomorrow's plenary in the morning, we're gonna be working on uh, a social activation, a media, uh, social media activation. So moving forward, I also wanna thank the AFP team. They've been working so hard. Nick, Maurice, Megan, Shazia, Sarav, and Jessica. And Jessica, I just wanna give a big shout out to her, uh, a senior director at the Alliance for Peacebuilding. 
her tremendous work as always uh, is someone uh, who I really want to point out. Throughout the conference, you'll be seeing all of the AFP staff. Please reach out to them, get to know them. They're really good people and they're dedicated and passionate about this work. I also want to thank all of you who are attending and participating and have given so graciously of your time. I am so excited for this agenda to be learning and listening and participating and collaborating with all of you. Please take advantage of all the sessions that are here. Please also participate in the chat, whether it's today or the next two or three days. Make sure to engage. This is how we build the field. I also want to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. Uh, you're incredible, and we are grateful for that. Um, as we go through the next three days, please make sure to hashtag rise to build peace. Um, tag things that you like, tag things that you don't like. Um, we make mistakes, and also the peace building field, we have to acknowledge our failures. Um, and again, I just want to thank our incredible board at the Alliance for Peace Building, which is a true partner. We're so lucky. Um, and on that note, I want to introduce Julia Roig, um, AFP's board chair. She's been part of the peace building community from the beginning. She was the longtime president of Partners Global and now the founder of the Horizons Project. So thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. And on behalf of the board of the Alliance for Peace Building, it is my pleasure to welcome you to PeaceCon at 10. Uh, it is wonderful to be here uh, in person here at USIP. We miss all of you in person. But like Liz said, what a joy it is to have so many of you be able to participate in the conference virtually. And our hope is, is that we can be together again sometime over uh, this next year and continue these uh, hybrid convenings uh, so that the breadth of our peace building field can continue to convene and be participating in these conversations. So also, I of course have to give a special thanks to USIP um, for their ongoing partnership for so many years. Uh, and a very special congratulations to Liz on assuming this new role as executive director. The board uh, spent a lot of time thinking about this new strategy of field building together with many of our members over this last year. And Liz assuming the role that she is right now is really indicative of the uh, commitment that we have to the facilitative leadership that Liz really embodies. Many of you have worked closely with her you know her well. She knows um, so many of our members and our partners all around the world. And we're committed to the Alliance for Peace Building being a space where we are expanding the field, learning, really uh, committed to more collective action. We know that this is needed now more than ever. Because it is true, the Alliance for Peace Building has been my professional home for almost 20 years. Um, not one of the founders in that uh, first uh, uh, gathering, that retreat. But the reason that I've chosen the Alliance for Peace Building to dedicate my energies to, both as a member and as a board member, is because of the breadth um, and depth of issues that we work on at the Alliance for Peace Building. And all of those are represented at this conference. You will find something to inspire you, you will find something to learn more about, you will meet new people, and as Liz really encouraged you, participate actively and be present. And she mentioned the title and how long we spend thinking about the title of this conference. The word that most resonated with me and got me most excited about uh, the conference this year is the word disruption. And I know that we think a lot about disruption out there in the world. But our field is also going through moments of disruption. And I think it's something that we also need to wrestle with during the conference. There are movements to decolonize aid 
um, and what that's going to look like with regards to the power imbalances within our field and the way that aid is administered, the systems that we all work within because we are a part of those systems that we know need to change. We're going to be wrestling with uh, what happened in Afghanistan over these last years and how many of us worked in that country and were a part of a system that resulted in what we're dealing with now. And we're dealing with diversity within our own leadership, within our own ranks, and organizations like WCAPS, Women of Color, Coming Together, Advancing Peace and Security and Conflict with their chapters all over the world, looking seriously at diversity, equity, and inclusion within the field, um, within leadership positions that all of us need to be uh, committed to and taking seriously. So as these moments um, of disruption feel uncomfortable, they also are moments of opportunities for change. And we know this as peace builders. We're good at this. People who work on conflict transformation can hold tensions and can work for positive change because the world does need our expertise right now. There's violent conflict. There's people who are traumatized in all areas of the world that need to be finding trauma-informed ways of coming together to work on common problems. And so what I would ask of you during this conference is to take full advantage, be present, connect uh, with your colleagues, but also be self-reflective. Be self-reflective of the ways that our own field of peace building is going to be disrupted um, going forward, and that we can take joy, um, but we can also accompany each other uh, in this moment. And so I also would like to say a special thanks to the entire AFP team, to all of you who have been working very hard on your presentations. Um, we know that this is a big collective effort, and uh, AFP really is all of you. And if you're not already a member of the Alliance for Peace Building, please sign up and join us on a regular basis, because this is the biggest event we have of the year, but there's so many other exciting things that happen throughout the year that we really would like you to continue to be involved with. So thank you very much to USIP, to the AFP, and enjoy the conference. The United States Institute of Peace is delighted to join our partners at the Alliance for Peace Building in welcoming you to the 10th annual PeaceCon. I consider it a privilege to share the stage this morning with Liz Hume, the executive director of the Alliance for Peace Building, and with the chairperson of their board, Julia Roig. My name is Lise Grande, and I'm the president of USIP. Our conference this year comes at a time when global realities are hitting hard. The world is two years into a global pandemic. There have been 10 coup or coup attempts during that time. And we are on the brink of an armed confrontation between two nuclear powers. The list goes on. New pressures, new technologies, new forms of exclusion and discrimination, continuing injustice, and greater inequality are driving conflict. And they're making it harder to mitigate violence and much harder to resolve conflicts when they arise. Many of us who work in peace building continue to use the peace building tools and mechanisms which we've established after decades of trial and error. These tools, including mediation, negotiation, dialogue, reconciliation, Nonviolent action, strategic religious engagement, security sector reform, conflict analysis, and systems thinking are being used to great effect across the globe. But one of the questions facing all of us as peace builders is whether we need to do more to create new tools and mechanisms in light of the pressures we're collectively facing. I think many of us feel that we probably do need to develop these tools and to do so as quickly as possible. During the next three days, we'll be able to dive deeply into what's driving conflict and think together about how we can more effectively use the tools we do have to prevent and resolve conflicts and to think collectively together about what new tools we need to develop. In addition to the many important conversations we'll be having, PeaceCon is a platform 
for us to honor the people around the world who every day and in every way build peace in the communities where they live and work. I hope everyone joins us this year in most particularly highlighting and appreciating the role that Afghan women have played during 44 years of near continuous conflict in their country. For decades, Afghan women have acted as their country's foremost peace builders, representing the aspirations of their communities during the Doha peace talks, helping to resolve familiar and tribal conflicts and mobilizing to address the drivers of conflict and discrimination. For this year's keynote address, we are privileged to welcome Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. In her role at the very top of the world's preeminent institution dedicated to global peace, Amina leads UN and global efforts to address the forces that are creating and driving conflict. She has fought for decades to increase access to education, improve clinics and health care across the world, fight poverty, and reform public sectors so they provide the services people need the most. Prior to her appointment, Amina served as the Minister of Environment in the Federal Republic of Nigeria, where she steered the country's efforts on climate action and efforts to protect the natural environment. As special advisor to former Secretary General of the United Nations Ban Ki-moon, Amina was responsible for helping to plan, facilitate, and shepherd the process of reaching global agreement on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and helping to create the Sustainable Development Goals. Amina's contributions to the great global processes that are helping to create peace and her leadership of those processes is truly inspirational. Dear friends, I'm pleased to send my greetings to the Alliance for Peacebuilding and the United States Institute for Peace. COVID-19, climate change, and deepening inequalities are fueling grievances, driving instability, and exacerbating the risk of violent conflict. Prolonged conflict, in turn, is among the biggest obstacles to achieving progress towards the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I see three priorities for action. First, we must scale up risk-informed development investments to address the structural drivers of conflicts. This requires closer collaboration between those working on development, climate, humanitarian and peace to deliver transformative, prevention-focused and conflict-sensitive responses. Our common agenda offers a blueprint for greater strategic foresight, risk preparedness and anticipatory decision-making anchored in the Sustainable Development Goals as our ultimate prevention tool. Second, we need to address inequalities build resilience to climate change and to ensure no one is left behind. In particular, marginalized communities in hard to reach areas. In the Sahel, the Horn of Africa and elsewhere, societies already straining under conflict and COVID-19 are among those hardest hit by climate change. They face even more severe and frequent impacts in the future. The commitment by developed countries to collectively double their adaptation finance by 2025 must be delivered in full and on time to reach developing countries and communities who need it most. Third, addressing inequalities means tackling gender inequalities. We must make women's leadership, meaningful participation and equality an absolute priority. When women are at the table, peace has a chance. We must also include young people more systematically in political, social, and economic life. Dear friends, together, and only together, can we build a more resilient, sustainable, just, prosperous, and peaceful world. Thank you. Good morning. On behalf of the U.S. Institute of Peace and the Alliance for Peace Building, let me express our deep appreciation to the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed, for those really important and insightful remarks. I'm Joe Hewitt, 
Vice President for Policy Learning and Strategy here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Thank you all for joining us today for this opening panel on climate change and peace building. This is a particularly important panel to USIP as we have just launched our new climate, environment, and conflict program in the last few months. We are aggressively moving in this direction because we realize that climate change and environmental degradation are increasingly a factor in conflicts around the world. We know that climate change is jeopardizing human security. There's no single statistic that can help us capture the breadth and depth of this challenge, but consider this. In 2070, in just 50 years, an estimated 30% of the global population will live in areas that experience an average annual temperature that's found in only 1% of the Earth's surface today. The challenges we face necessitate a global transition to green energy, but that transition also has the potential to fuel conflict, geopolitical competition for mineral control, mining operations in fragile states that disregard human rights and result in pollution of land and water, decarbonization of economies that leads to destabilization of national governments, localized disputes around land rights and benefit sharing in the implementation of green technologies, and social unrest as societies adapt to new economic realities. These issues increasingly require a better understanding as we integrate them into our peace building work. We think that working on environmental issues can be a powerful entry point to peace, but we must be tireless about applying lessons from current experience to guide our future work if we're to expect environmental peace building to be a fruitful driver of positive change. We look forward to learning a lot from today's speakers. So with that, it's now time to hand things over to the moderator for today's opening panel, Andrew Revkin. Andrew Revkin is one of America's most honored and experienced environmental journalists. He has written on climate change and its impacts for over 30 years, primarily for the New York Times, but also in several books. He is currently the founding director of the Initiative on Communication and Sustainability at Columbia University's Earth Institute. It is truly my great pleasure to hand things over to Mr. Revkin, who will introduce our panel. Andy, over to you. It's an honor to be part of this discussion today. Uh, I apologize for my, if there's any uh, audio or internet ex issues for me. I'm in rural Maine helping take care of my mother-in-law, uh, not in my normal uh, office in the Hudson Valley. Um, this is an incredibly important discussion. I hope those in the audience will uh, submit questions. You'll see a Q&A box on the screen and uh, we'll try to get to as many as possible toward the end. And I can follow up, you know, as much as I can uh, in the projects I do online in the coming days and weeks and months. This, this issue of clarifying what can happen to um, foster resilience, to foster equity, to reduce potential for conflict, where climate and people are changing is, is one of the most important challenges we face, obviously. As, as the statistic, that one statistic that Joe just uh, included, I think really spells out where we're going in terms of the changing climate. But what I learned as a journalist, and I've been writing about climate change for 30, well, since 1988, since before there was an IPCC and the UNFCCC, is that the social climate is still the most powerful determinant of uh, bad or good outcomes. The climate is changing, coastlines will be changing for centuries to come but how we respond, what we can do in society is a key. Um, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are also kind of easy to look at. They're, they're easy to measure. They're, they're not easy to look at, they're easy to measure. Cyclones are events. So what do we pay attention to in the media and in politics, events, disasters? Uh, we don't do a very good job of paying attention to these underlying conditions that don't come with a sudden dramatic violence for through these, this, this span where you just heard that statistic at the beginning, you know, we're now at a 30 year high global violent conflict right now. So we, uh, Gillian Caldwell, 
She's the Climate Co Change Coordinator and Deputy Assistant Administrator at the U.S. Agency for International Development, responsible for planning, directing, and supervising all climate and energy work at the agency. That is a huge challenge and opportunity, and we'll talk about that. Her long career at the intersection of human rights and environmental action, particularly her focus on communication, the role of video and film, uh, makes her a very special guest today. Uh, communication matters enormously. What we see is what we pay attention to. What we don't see is what we miss. Uh, Ambassador Fred Nagoga, who is the head of conflict prevention and early warning division of the early and uh, the early warning division at the Peace and Security Department of the African Union, is here. A long and storied career, right in the middle of uh, on the ground situations where uh, things go one way or the other, and uh, we have great regrets or, or lots of uh, congratulations. Patrick Youssef, Regional Director for Africa, the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, I'm in touch quite a bit with the Red Cross these days, uh, sadly, in the journalism that I do. Uh, you know, again, we're in a chronic state of emergency in so many parts of the world. Uh, he's worked on the ground in Sudan, Chad, Yemen, Iraq, so many places. Um, we're going to start right away with a set of in, uh, sort of initiating questions. And um, the, I'll start with Polly and then Gillian and then Ambassador Nagoga and Patrick. Um, I'm not seeing you on screen, but I'm assuming you're all visible to the audience. Um, for Polly, what I try to do when I talk to people on my webcast is start with a very simple question. How did you become who you are so far? That can take a little time, and I want to think we have a good sense of what drives you and how you got to where you are. But what I really want to get from each of you today is some input on this question. When you think about these words, climate, conflict, and peace, the core questions on the table here today, uh, what keeps you up at night? Like, What's the core one or two things that uh, give you a sense of opportunity or sense of frustration? Okay. Um, I guess I'll jump right in. Thank you, Andrew. And I just want to thank USIP and AFP and Liz in particular for your energetic leadership on this topic um, and everybody involved in putting together this amazing event. And it's an honor and privilege to be here. So I think to answer your question, Andy, you know, jumping right in, I'm going to speak from um, what we see in our work um, on the ground in Nigeria with our partner, the Neem Foundation, is that climate change is significantly compounding conflict dynamics. Dynamics. And, you know, as research has demonstrated, it is a th threat multiplier exacerbating existing vulnerabilities. So, you know, the greatest worry is, is knowing that the climate security risks will continue to intensify, um, that the fragile regions in particular are going to experience the most severe consequences of climate change and, with, and often with the least capacity to cope, and that people affected by conflict are among the most vulnerable um, to climatic crisis and also often among the most neglected by climate action. So the concern is, you know, if we don't take concrete action to work differently to mitigate these compound conflict, conflict, uh, conflict, conflict climate dynamics, mostly over resource issues, that the consequences in human terms will be catastrophic and much worse than we're already seeing. But on the other hand, to your point, I mean, along with the threat, there is an opportunity, and I think that was highlighted in some of the, the comments in the introduction as well, to work differently, to work collectively in a more integrated way, recognizing the need not only for effective national policies and international support for those policies and programs, but also the critical importance of taking sort of an integrated and inclusive approach that includes supporting local actors, working with community organizations, develop very content specific conflict sensitive solutions uh, and approaches to mitigate climatic pressures. You know, the evidence is clear that, that if climate security adaptation and resilience solutions don't include local voice and experience, they certainly increase the risk of inadvertently exacerbating or, um, or creating new conflict dynamics. Um, you know, and I mean, certainly the examples of the impact are not hard to find. The migration yeah. from climate is well documented, um, and certainly in Africa, um, which is particularly susceptible to the negative effects um, with many African economies being primarily agricultural. So maybe I can talk more later um, specifically about, you know, our project there, but I'll stop there. No, well, that's a great start and a great case study. Uh, you know, Nigeria has so much opportunity there's for uh, becoming a dominant player in, in, in the globe. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an enormous country. 
I just want to dig in on one thing that I've studied or reported on there, which is um, the importance of getting girls through school and the impediments of getting through girls through school as a pathway to stable populations, to more functional, uh, you know, equitable society. And this gets to where the, the systems here get really complicated because the does disruption and violence in Nigeria and it's keeping impeding full access to education then is leading to sustained high fertility rates, uh, limited women's uh, power to shape families. Is that, is that, a, a pro which is it, is that a bigger problem or a bigger opportunity? Is that, what does that feel like? That keeps me up at night. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking me, I mean, it is also interrelated. I mean, we see this, you know, we're focused very much in the, in, on the pastoralist population and the pro I mean, project we're working on is, you know, early warning, early response systems. Um, we're bringing, you know, pastoralists and herders um, and trying to bring them together. These are normally antagonistic groups. And to the point that you're making, uh, you know, it's actually been shown that education you know, for the Fulani, who are the traditional herders, um, you know, offering educational opportunities has had a measurable impact on giving people, and this including girls, to your point, um, in in sort of mitigating um, in mitigating conflict. And we, there's been a very conscious effort of bringing women into these early warning, early response platforms. And there's a lot of, you know, resistance, um, as you can imagine, culturally to that. But that, you know, slowly that has changed, and women are actually actively they're being trained as community dialogue facilitators um and playing a really active role and i think you know they're all these intertwined you know the things all connect one to another um so, so i mean it's to your point <laughs> great well, well we'll circle back to a couple of those things in the solutions section uh gillian caldwell uh what a, what a career you've had so far um uh, for anyone who doesn't know your journey uh dig in a little online and what a portfolio you've taken on uh, so I, I imagine there's more than one thing that keeps you up late at night, but it, it, maybe we could focus on the opportunities you see that are so far unrealized. But what are the things that drive you as you look at energy, climate, and development at this at the same at the same time? What does that feel like? Well, first, thanks so much to uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace and, and Andy to you for the introduction. Andy and I first met, I think, 15 years ago when I was leading a campaign to pass a law in the U.S. that would put a cap and a price on carbon emissions. And some of you may recall the Waxman-Markey bill, which passed in the House and got stalled in the Senate, much like President Biden's Build Back Better legislation today. Um, and there's so many important climate-related investments uh, in that bill. And, of course, that's a key sticking point for Senators Manchin and others uh, that are holding it up. So, you know, thing, things change, and they, and they stay the same. Um, and as far as change is concerned, um, you know, what's keeping me up at night is that it's coming faster and more furious than even the world's most experienced scientists in the IPCC projected. Um, so, you know, there's this concern that climate change is, is, is driving transformation uh, in, you know, extremely negative uh, ways uh, more, more swiftly than, than, than human and natural communities can adapt to. Um, and, of course, it has, you know, these uh, really compounding impacts um, in terms of exacerbating climate and, um, you know, uh, creating instability in the governments uh, and, the, and the underlying physical infrastructure required to, um, you know, to respond to climate. Um, I think you, you asked me about opportunities um, rather than threats. Um, and of course, try to keep my eyes focused on those because it's just too depressing um, to, to spend all your time thinking about what's wrong with the world. And, and the truth is that, you know, we have, there's so many opportunities. If you think about, um, the, the risk that climate uh, compounds um, uh, resource scarcity, which can precipitate conflict. Um, you can look at the opportunity, such as um, the systems we've invested in with NASA and others, the technologies that give us advanced warning regarding drought and other um, impending uh, natural disasters. Um, 
so that we can be proactive in preparing for, um, you know, both for the, the, the potential physical impacts, but in, in promoting the kind of cooperation and collaboration that's necessary to ensure effective sharing of scarce resources. So, I mean, looking at, uh, looking at it from a positive perspective, um, this can, this can move peace building forward in anticipatory ways more, more swiftly than it would um, otherwise, if we're proactive enough. And it, and it pays to be proactive. I mean, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that, um, you know, we've got at least $3 trillion in costs ahead of us on mitigation and adaptation, but we're going to have a whole lot more money to spend if we aren't proactive in addressing um, the underlying infrastructure and the changes in human community and how we're organized to adapt to this. So, uh, you know, and of course, there's the opportunity of, of transforming our in, entire energy system and, and creating a just transition um, rather than uh, finding ourselves in a world full of geopolitical tensions and 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 uh, fights over resource scarcity. So I just hope we can keep our eyes on the prize here. Um, we can't. It's you know even I think COVID's another analogy. It's not about going back to the way life was. It's about recognizing the world's fundamentally uh, changed forever. It's continuing to change. And if we adapt in intelligent ways that are, you know, frankly grounded in some, some love and justice, we'll be much better off than we were to begin with. You know, I hadn't thought about this till just now as we were speaking, but uh, I've had recent conversations on my webcast through the Columbia Climate School with uh, Deanne Criswell, the FEMA director. That, for those who don't know, that's the Emergency Management Agency. And even the name of that agency is anachronistic because it's about managing an emergency, meaning the emergency is already happening. And the disasters and conflict community, everyone on this call today is about mitigation of risk before the worst happens. And they're doing their best there. There are some interesting uh, project, projects underway at FEMA to try to tip the balance even in funding within the agency toward and, and with the Forest Service, for example, which also has a huge billion plus firefighting budget and sort of a $100 million mitigation of fire risk budget. And what you all are focusing on is, well, can, what can we do within our structures to do the same thing? So maybe we'll follow up and have, I could try to schedule some kind of a brainstorm between the disaster community and the peace building community. Very interesting. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you briefly before we get to uh, Patrick and the ambassador is um, about some of the real dynamic tension between energy access and climate and climate stability. Uh, USAID, uh, State Department generally, you know, you are still trying to develop, let's say, clean cooking, an arena I've, I've worked really hard in several years ago when I was at ProPublica, the uh, capacity for people to cook cleanly on fuels that don't kill, like charcoal. And, and yet sometimes that can be a fossil fuel and many countries from Africa at the COP26 talks were starting to worry that the cutoff to finance by rich countries for you know, fossil fuel development may impede their energy rights, even as we're talking about climate. So does that intersection of climate and energy priorities come, is, a is there a tangle there or is that more of an opportunity to? Well, I mean, there is some tension, but I think it's overstated. Um, of course, as you mentioned, energy poverty is is greatest greater on the African continent than anywhere on the world. More more people in Africa are, are functioning without electricity than than anywhere else. And of course, you know, electricity is critical to all sorts of health and education and economically related outcomes. So um, it's really a challenge. Uh, Power Africa is the U.S. government's uh, response to that. It was launched under Obama, and it's an inter interagency initiative housed within USAID, and the focus is on tackling energy poverty. But over time, they've begun to... Um, really evolve their metrics of success to include decarbonization, um, which hopefully will come into um, you know, a front and center consideration alongside energy poverty. And in many places, I just read a, a Bloomberg study indicating that in many, in many places, it's cheaper these days to go with renewable energy than it is to go with, with, with fossil fuels. The U.S. government has just released guidance, which um, 
prohibits funding of coal and which allows funding for fossil fuels only in very limited circumstances where there is no other viable alternative or whether there's significant national security interests at stake. And, you know, places like Ukraine uh, would be one such example when you look about, at, you know, some of the yeah. dependency on, on Russian oil for a country like uh, Germany. But in any case, um, I think it's. I don't think it's as big a challenge as some people would like to suggest. And I think if we're um, creative in looking at how we can leapfrog over fossil fuel infra infrastructure and invest in decentralized grids, we'll be much better off. Yeah, and, and one thing people miss, including the media, is that the Electrify Africa Act passed in the most divided Congress in history under Obama. Got signed. There, there are if you shape priorities around things that really matter, you know, development, electricity, Africa, even our pretty broken system, the United States can do some remarkable things. So thank you. And now uh, on to the ambassador, Ambassador Fred Nagoga, uh, head, head of conflict prevention and early warning African Union. You again have been on the ground in so many situations in regions where climate is the source of vulnerability even now. Uh, what keeps you up late at night. I have a feeling you focus, you're, you're full of solutions, even as you recognize the problems. Well, thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me and for having me. Um, I thought it was important for me to be here because uh, this is a topic that is on top of our agenda uh, continentally. What keeps me up at night? Um, what keeps me up at night is the droughts, the high te temperatures, uh, the displaced people as a result of, of, of climate change. I think, uh, you know, we are the least, uh, you know, the African continent is the least in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the greenhouse uh, emission, yet we suffer the most consequences uh, as we speak. So we recognize that this is for us a priority. We have had uh, about eight sessions of the AU Peace and Security Council, uh, AU Peace and Security Council uh, agenda, eight sessions focusing squarely on, on climate change and its impact on our continent. And we are working very closely, for example, to integrate climate change within our early warning system, therefore helping some of our member states also to be able to, uh, to establish their own early warning systems about climate change, but also our regional economic communities. We have been actually, uh, the AU has decided to appoint a special envoy, uh, which will uh, actually be focusing on uh, climate peace and security, and uh, also establishing a, a, a climate peace and security fund. So uh, these are some of the things that we've been working on, but we, we are constantly dealing with these conflicts. Uh, many don't know, but actually the Darfur conflict was the first conflict actually, which was a result of climate change. Uh, it's often forgotten, but we're having many more. For example, today, as I speak with you, the drought in Somalia is causing so many uh, displacements, and the displacement are actually uh, putting a pressure on the host communities, and as a result, the communities are fighting. I heard Polly talking about pastoralists and herders' uh, conflict. It is everywhere. We, we see it not only in Nigeria, but we're seeing it in the Central African Republic. Uh, we're seeing it uh, in many, many countries. So these are some of the challenges that we're faced with. We, we're trying to our level best to, uh, to address them. But one thing that is for sure, as Jillian said, if we don't come together and work together, uh, you know, we will, we, it will impact all of us. An unstable Africa will not serve the, well, the world well. It will create all sorts of other uh, issues which will affect everybody. So I think that uh, uh, the more we, we keep this on the agenda, the more we have constructive conversations, the more people are <laughs> less selfish and, and, and really, um, uh, you, you know, uh, honestly address the issues. I think we will do well. We have in November this year, COP, uh, I think in the COP97, which is going to be in, in Egypt, 27, sorry, is it 27? Or, uh, I think I'm, I was getting it wrong. Yeah. It's going to be in Egypt. And so they're going to be uh, discussing some of these issues. And I think it will also be a great opportunity to uh, highlight some of the challenges, but also the opportunities, as Jillian and Polly and yourself, Andrew, has mentioned. Thank you. That's a brilliant uh, intervention. Uh, there's so much to do. And this, this is a good time to get to this question of what does the developed world. Oh, I thought I turned off that phone. Sorry. Again, I'm in rural Maine at my mother in law's house. It'll stop in a second. Um, what does the developed world owe Africa? It's not just what's under the climate treaty. Um, you know, we can't get into the whole history of colonization and the like, but if 
the world wants to have more forecasting capacity for um, weather disruptions, whether from climate change or uh, natural variability, there needs to be more data and more analysis in Africa, and meaning, and also more on the ground capacity in Africa. What are universities like Columbia, where I work, and what are our governments not doing sufficiently to build Africa's capacity, even just to monitor and analyze and then convey those risks? Uh, it, there's there's data gaps that are profound still. Just simple questions of how many areas are being monitored and the like. Uh, what's that feel like? You, you know, what for the African Union? Uh, it's not just about you know how much money you're going to get under the climate, the details of the climate agreement. What are the capacities that need to be built? Thank you so much. This is this is uh, actually uh, you know with COVID, one thing that we realized was that the importance of investing in education and, and research, research uh, on the continent, because the, the entire world was able to produce vaccines, but we were not able to produce vaccines because our, our we, were, we were lacking when it comes to research. So this is something that we we want to be uh, investing in, and where we will need actually support from uh, the you know the world in general. And I think that the more we invest in research, the you know the more also we will be able to invest in the infrastructure that can withstand uh, you know some of these shocks. Uh, I think it's it's critical. I would like to also highlight something else, which is which is uh, which is the continent is facing. So some of these challenges are actually also creating a gap in those who govern and those who are being governed. And as a result, uh, again, and, and it's causing uh, quite uh, a lot of instability on our continent. So I think that the world owes us not only to do what is responsible in terms of li limiting their gas emission. But I think that they also, uh, uh, you know, they all, you know, we all need to invest in, 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 in not only in the in the early warning mechanism, but also in the prevention. And when it happens, we also need to invest on how to respond uh, to to these crises, working together. Well, hopefully, we can all work on building better systems so that that there, there are great templates. FuseNet, the famine early warning system demonstrates that, that we have this potential to bring together expertise, connections to communities, and uh, do better. Uh, Patrick Youssef uh, at the Red Cross, uh, I, you know, if anyone is in a state of constant response and an emergency, it's you. But every once in a while, you must have the ability to step back and say, where do we go from here? So again, late at night or early in the morning, um, what gets you, uh, you steamed up as an opportunity or key problem. Andy, thank you so much, first and foremost, uh, to you, but also to the, to the organizers, to USIP, but also to the Alliance for Peace, Peace Building. And I think if we really think about the impact of what one can achieve, it's exactly with these alliances, with having different experts around the table, it's having different voices, those who can oppose and not only, you know, uh, drive the line of what has been chartered by others. Um, I think what what keeps me, but also many managers and field operators in uh, with the Red Cross is is the following questions. You know, are we doing the right thing? Are we as humanitarians doing enough? Um, and I guess what keeps me up uh, all the time and not always at night is this you know sense of injustice that we felt when we started speaking about vaccines, COVID vaccines on the continent. As a regional director for Africa, I'm faced with, you know, <laughs> thousands, hundreds of voices coming from the field about this lack of fairness, about the sustainability of the world's promises and the lack of concrete actions when tackling uh, climate issues. And here, if I may just again teach from what we hear on the ground, you know, through, through our work of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, you know, the biggest network of volunteers of those people exactly living the dual hardship from wars and violence. Um, I think what we see is very clear. People affected by wars and violence are on the front lines of the climate crisis. If we have to get out of such panels, but also worldwide discussions around the duality of armed conflicts and climate, we really need to put that in huge 
figures in big, bold uh, characters. Front line, the people living the duality are on the front line of the climate crisis. And there's a massive disadvantage when it comes to adapting to climate change. And I think the reasons are obvious, which I hear when I was recently in the Sahel or in Somalia, but also in less visible contexts, to be honest, like the Central African Republic or Mozambique, which, as you know, is currently bracing for the next tropical storm while having to deal with half a million displaced people in the region of Pemba. And again, the constat, the evaluation is the same. It's the same, by the way, that obstructs uh, the path to peace and prolongs wars. And many have been mentioned by, John, by Joe Hewitt in his introductory remarks. Weakened institutions, essential services, disruptions, poor economies, lack of social cohesion. And clearly, while there, is, there are very few uh, cases where there was direct correlation between a climate or an environmental degradation and an armed conflict, as per the Geneva Conventions, I think climate change in, in, is inseparably linked to some of the most pressing security challenges of our time. And Liz Grande had made reference to this too, which I found spot on. And I think the data, to conclude, supports our observations about this double vulnerability. Some 60% of the 25 countries affected or the most vulnerable or at least ready to adapt to climate change are affected by wars. And I, give, I can provide you with a long list. So for now, I think the gist of it is the following. Climate action and finance to support this action are particularly weak in places of conflict because of the challenges I mentioned, because of the, the hesitancy of those who really can make the difference on the ground in implementing long-term plan in such environments. So as you can imagine, there is an amalgam of hundreds and thousands of, of things to worry about, and on top of which comes this life-threatening uh, menace on people's lives, that is climate hazards and climate adaptation, which is lacking, unfortunately, in today's humanitarian landscape. Back to you, Andy. Thank you. This is really uh, helpful as well. Uh, there's some questions that are coming in, but it's uh, this is the key moment for you in the audience to offer your questions and uh, observations in the, the Q&A box you should see wherever you're watching. There's a couple that have come in, but I want to now start more of a conversation here. And a point that came up that resonates throughout what you've all been saying is, in one way or the other, you've all recognized that if you work on basic components of a system, a social system, that boost resilience, boost equity, reduce vulnerability particularly, you, you have, that creates sort of an insulator effect when there's a shock, whether it's Mozambique's next uh, cyclone or the like. And, and we kind of know, know this, the peace building community knows this better than anyone, I think. But it, is it starting to percolate into our broader national and international funding and prioritization? I'm going to frame this around something that was said uh, in 2017 when the Trump administration was settling in. There was a conference in Europe on security. And I wrote a story about this. And there was a European um, official, the high representative for foreign affairs and security. She said, um, she was talking to the Trump administration, you need the European Union because we invest in basic social development in places like sub-Saharan Africa. When you invest in the fight against climate change, you also invest in, in your own security. In other words, national security, wherever you are, Germany, the United States, is abetted by cutting vulnerabilities in places in the world that can be unstable. And I just want to get a sense if you feel that's really, is that important and, and is it happening? Maybe back to Gillian briefly and then, and then uh, around the circle here. Is the world really getting this? Well, the, the, military, the military establishment sure is. I mean, there have been, I mean, the Pentagon has been out in front on climate change as a major national security threat. And there have been a number of 
um, both public, public and, and classified briefings on point. So um, I, I, there's there's no doubt in, in their mind uh, and their experts on this front, no doubt in mine either. Um, you know, I, I think we've we've still been slow to uh, you know to, to come to the table, and um, you know I think the national security arguments one that resonates on 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 either side of the aisle and can be important. I mean, what you were just saying, Andy, uh, and what. Uh, our colleague from the African Union Commission was talking about, it really relates to capacity and, and preparedness. And interestingly, we just um, commissioned a study on what the U.S. government and USAID in particular could do to accelerate development in Africa. And they honed in after speaking to hundreds of people across the continent on two things, digital skills acceleration and climate analytics and planning. And we just launched, interestingly, before we had the results of that study, but um, hopefully we're on point, uh, an initiative with the African Union Commission called CACHI, which is a comprehensive Africa climate change initiative. So the focus here is on strengthening the country level and regional data capability to um, create an an Africa-wide platform to make sense of the mitigation and adaptation challenges Africa is confronting. And if you look at you know, the funding, which of course has been too slow to come as the keynote uh, speaker remarked, um, but will be flowing hopefully uh, in the direction it ought to from developing countries to developing uh, countries. Um, the question is, what's the readiness? What's the preparedness to absorb that? What, is the, what are the data? What's the arguments for the use of that? of that uh, money. So um, I think that's an incredibly important initiative to make sure we're investing in the right places and that Africa is well positioned to argue for and absorb the, the funding it so desperately needs. Just briefly, there was a question that came in that got to this. Um, let me see if I have it right here. And this is a question from the audience. I wonder about the trickle down effects of these programs, Power Africa, and certain World Bank distributed funds for certain states in Nigeria have never been heard of. The people are not allowed, are not feeling the impact. I worry a lot about these on the ground realities. How can we address this? Which kind of gets to your point about you, it's not just money, it's like, how do you make sure it gets to where it's needed and all that? Maybe I'll just jump in um, Paul yeah. here you know, on Nigeria, because I think it is just such, it's where we're working, but it is such a you know, stark case in point about, you know, the impact of climate change, because it's on so many multiple dimensions. You know, it is the most populous country with 200 people, economy closely tied to gas and oil, um, with link directly linked to social inequity and awful uh, environmental disasters and one of the highest rates of energy poverty as well. But it is unquestionably a top national security and recognized as such issue for Nigeria. Um, and it's, you know, it's just, it's not just the North again, it's all across the country and, you know, people being pushed It just, you know, it's, it's the, the, the cascade of effects, people pushed into cities, urban areas, not having capacity and adequate air, air, you know, infrastructure and the, and the erosion of social, you know, societal customs and family structures. Um, and I think, you know, it's, um, you know, and, and certainly again, in the, the pastoralist area, the, the ramifications, you know, are very direct in terms of national security, um, because it's well documented that, you know, this farmer herder conflict um, has 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 sort of enhanced uh, increased vulnerability to recruitment by extremist groups, um, including Boko Haram. So, um, you know, I think it's it's kind of in the forefront. And I know the Nigerian government, I think, has passed some, I think, like 10 or 11 pieces of, you know, of national legislation related to climate. Some of them, you know, I think have been some missteps and had some you know, negative repercussions. But, you know, it's it's no question that it's a huge issue. And I think back to the, you know, Ambassador Nagoga's excellent point. Points and, and Patrick's, you know, on the capacity of fig figuring out, you know, where, you know, where the gaps are, how do things trickle down to the local level, because it really has to be at a, you know, assistance, and it's a systemic issue, and it has to be approached from a systemic, um, you know, you know, perspective, i.e. from, you know, all different angles. Um, so, you know, that's just my two cents there. <laughs> No, would, would the ambassador want to want to uh, offer any ideas on that for these questions? It, again, it's kind of like how do you work on the chickens and the eggs all at the same time? 
if I can come in just, uh, just I, I think the other time we, we committed with UNEP to look at, um, you know, what are the, the natural resources in dispute, just to kind of get a, a sense of, uh, of what, what we're faced with. And it was interesting. The first natural resource that is a cause of conflict was land. Second was actually minerals. Third was oil. Fourth was water. And the fifth was fisheries. And, uh, and, and all these five uh, natural resources, when you look at them, they are all affected by, by climate change. So like I, like I said, and as Holly just mentioned, we need to invest not only in early warning, we need to invest in the prevention, uh, you, know, the, you know, how to prevent a crisis escalating. We need to invest in the response when the crisis do occur. And most importantly, how do we stabilize the communities that have been affected? By, uh, by 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 some some of these changes, and this is something that we we, we tend to often uh, uh, overlook, and uh, and I think that uh, I was just thinking of a while back we we saw. Uh, you know, we, we're seeing some some countries actually where the, the water levels are rising. In my own country, Burundi, the other time, the water levels of Lake Tanganyika just rose, and a whole section of the city people had to be evacuated. So these are some of the things that really uh, you started earlier. What keeps up at night? You know, you th we think about all these things, and we look at the resources that we have, our ability to analyze and to respond, and and it gives you a headache, it gives you anxiety about uh, how we're going to be able to uh, to deal with all of this. Thank you. You know, and there's a question that came in that gets at your point about Burundi and that lake. It's the challenge of uh, turning global data projections into local, meaningful forecasts and the like. Is there an information gap in how climate change will impact localized conflict? So conflict, as you said, is related to resources, clashes of cultures, uh, stresses. And, and I guess this gets to one or the other to me, it comes down to some of the basics, fostering access to education, making sure that American universities have partner universities in developing countries, making sure that extension services are a real thing, using data. There, there are some really cool uh, examples of using uh, communication technology, uh, SMS and radio, old fashioned, to make sure uh, regional rural areas that don't have the internet necessarily have information. But again, where's the where's the headline in that? <laughs> if you're if you're a funding a funder, if you're at the UNDP, or how do you do that? It's an interesting question. So I think I Gillian, you had a oh sure, Patrick, please. I mean, uh, I mean, there's, it's so difficult to answer this question. Although, in a way, uh, what should reassure us is that we don't need to start from zero. In a way, we've been also adapting the in the humanitarian sector our work to really focus on building social cohesion in the communities where such a feature has been either dismantled or to totally erased, which explains why, as the ambassador has, uh, has just mentioned, intercommunal violence, which doesn't amount to a war or an armed conflict, is on the rise everywhere in sub-Saharan Africa, by the way, leading to more death and injuries more than the war with a group like the Islamic State in the Western Africa province around the Lake Chad, or with uh, Jnim and many opposing factions in the Sahel region. So in a way, I think building resilience is part of focusing or zooming in on what matters for people affected by wars. And putting people at the center, I think it's very critical to build on what we have already done. If I'm just giving an, an anecdotal example of a delegation today, if one of our embassies delegations in the field that has built its operational planning for the year to come purely on substitution, and, uh, and substitution meaning providing food, water, basically making sure that they fill the gap of what governments and institutions should have been doing on their collective behalf, either because they're not present on the ground, governments that is, or simply don't have the control to do it. So I think there we, we have a lot of features to build on, and I think it's critical to rebalance humanitarian efforts and focus more on preventive responses to strengthen people's resilience and adaptive capacities. And in a way, you know, short-terminism is deadly in this in this world in, in this uh, in this role. So fi short-term fixes are clearly not sufficient. And I think beyond 
because we're all super import, I mean, super brilliant in providing the problem analysis. But if we link it to humanitarian consequences and we consider that bullets alone are not drivers for, of environmental degradations in theaters of war, I think this convergence mostly threatens people's lives and health and worsens food and economic and work, water insecurity. And in fragile countries that, which are in danger, they're becoming stuck in these cycles of conflict. I beg anyone on this panel, but also in the audience, to tell me how can we resolve the, the situation of 7.1 million today in Somalia when we have no access to them, and they're all hit hard by the worst drought in the last decade. So I think conflicts themselves can certainly man damage the natural environment, but also reduce further people's resilience. So moving from an emergency, purely emergency mindset to building resilience and focusing on empowering those econ uh, economic communities that His Excellency the Ambassador mentioned, the fishermen, the, the agriculture, the uh, farmers, but also the herders, uh, would also not only build their own resilience, but allow for better protection spaces for people that are affected by those transhumans traveling, stepping into farmers' areas, and creating these difficult uh, relations that, unfortunately, is so, so difficult to gain. And on the practical side, I want just to propose what we have done in the ICRC, in the Red Cross movement. We've been really working to galvanize, to first to look at ourselves, uh, right? And try with a with the climate charter, climate and environmental charter for humanitarian organizations to be to lead by example. This charter has now been signed by over 200 uh, humanitarian organizations, but also gaining more support from states like Switzerland, the United States, and Norway. We just launched a climate fund, which will help us as an organization minimize our emissions by 140,000, but also uh, cut on our expenses from 30 to 50 million Swiss francs in the next couple of years. So thinking about ourselves, but also collaborating with other partners, in my opinion, would be one of the winning recipes. So we don't reinvent the wheel for something that we have, you know, lived throughout our uh, ICRC, but also humanitarian careers. And all of those connected to this call are certainly examples and testimonies of that hard work that has occupied us. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, you know, there's a, it's like a, a burst of, like a heavy downpour of really great questions has just come in and we only have about 12 minutes left. So I want to be sure that those in the audience know what I will do. I, I commit personally to running at least one of my sustain what uh, webcasts uh, to sort of fill in the gaps as we go forward uh, to do another follow-up. Uh, these conversations are never the end of something. They're always the beginning of something. I'm just going to, I'm going to try to bundle these a little bit if that's okay. And, and then have you all uh, weigh in, uh, just raise your hand or shout out. Um, cities, of course, uh, whether you're in Africa, uh, in South Asia, are a key part of the future. And, and I, I wrote a 2007 story in the Times on that showed how cities can greatly insulate or reduce climate vulnerability. It was long, it's, it's too complicated to get into details. But what should be done at the global level to prepare cities in vulnerable regions and or make them more able to do what someone here said earlier, uh, to receive, to be a receiving city. This is a term of art these days, receiving cities. Anyone want to jump in, in there right, right away? If not, we'll go into the next one. Um, there's this very particular question about for the AU and for the ambassador, I think. Uh, how can the AU or other African organizations Promote cooperation over complex geopolitical issues like GERD. This is the, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Uh, what do we need to do with data, resources, or capacities to in situations like this? And if you're not dug in on that, don't worry about it. We can go on. Maybe you might be frozen. Um, I'm not sure I heard the question very well. Well, I think my, my my connection was a bit problematic. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, uh, your, your connection is a little slow, and that's another issue we can talk about in the future webcast on uh, digital connectivity. 
how can the um, African Union or other organizations promote cooperation over complex geopolitical issues like the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam? And maybe, maybe we'll circle back to that if time uh, allows. Um, here's a sort of an overarching question. It, it actually gets to one that was asked of, of Patrick. So these two together, once someone said, what, what's an example of how you build social cohesion? And there's another question, uh, although conflict is related to resources, isn't separation consciousness or the lack of recognition of the interdependence of everyone's well-being an issue too? In other words, so basically social cohesion. What does that look like? Or are there great examples of how it can be built in situations where things would go badly otherwise? Maybe I can. Uh, yeah. Patrick, do you want to go? No, please, Polly. Okay. I'll follow. <laughs> Quickly. Uh, I just, I, I think, and, you know, going back to, to Patrick's point, too, about, you know, we're not starting from zero. You know, there are a lot of, you know, things, processes that have been used over time. And I, you know, just point to these early warning, early response systems where, you know, in, in the instance in, um, in our project in Nigeria are just are bringing people together. Um, who may not normally interact in communities and sometimes are in fact antagonistic. And it's a process of, you know, people getting to know each other, developing trust. Um, you know, they may not agree, but, you know, having platforms or form neutral forums where people can come together and discuss things, um, you know, actually does build social cohesion. I mean, you know, we've seen in post-genocide situations, post-Rwanda, post-Bosnia, you know, what is possible um, um, and also how challenging it is. But, you know, I think there are, you know, there are very good examples of, of approaches and tools that have been used um, over many years uh, where, you know, relatively simple, um, but it is, it is, a, you know, a challenge of, of bringing people together, um, and, and developing relationships and means of communication, which are not otherwise possible. And I will hand it over to Patrick. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, th thanks, Polly. Um, and, and again, excellent question. You know, it's, uh, Polly just spoke about diversifying also our partners, thinking about complementarity about multi-stakeholders, about multi-sectoral engagement. But, you know, if you think about those spaces that are tainted by wars and violence since years, since now three decades in Somalia, 10 years in the Sahel, over 15 years in the Lake Chad region, one has to stop and reflect about and see exactly that in protracted crises, we do have a quite a difficult, difficult challenge to adapt to the responses we offer to people. Hence the question of bringing some social cohesion back to the communities mostly affected. And I believe, and that's, I'm just inspired by what we do as ICRC, I think it goes through four main areas. One is to be able to provide humanitarian responses that brings people's dignities back to the fore rather than create dependence on humanitarian assistance. And here again, we are so privileged to be working with Red Cross and Red Crescent volunteers across the globe. That just provides us that essence of whether people have been, have people's dignity have been indeed restored by providing them with the food, with the water, et cetera. The challenges we see today, for example, as uh, in Ethiopia and the Tigray region, three years of bad harvest will certainly amount to a crisis, even if, if it's not a catastrophe already. And I think that's the first element. The second element is to clearly building resilience as opposed to providing 100 kilos of rice for a family that has been displaced for 10 years to, be, to listen to them and architect together the humanitarian response that gives them the opportunity again to sustain their livelihoods and redress by themselves. The third, I think, and that relates to the, the common elements that international humanitarian law and the Geneva Convention say about the rights of people to live in such spaces and brings environmental degradation to the fore. And I think this is a very important point because this does not de-responsibilize states that are enduring armed conflicts from these responsibilities. One of the ministers told me, without naming the state, that you know, what, what, what do you expect to do? All 
is, is going to the to the war efforts, and this is God's this is God's will on us. But I, again, comparing to other contexts, that argument doesn't fly that high. So building resilience is certainly third, and fourth is the protection of people from these vulnerabilities, those in places of detention that no one's talk about, those in IDP camps, those migrants stranded in Agadez, Niger, before heading to the Mediterranean. And fourth, I think, is to, is to focus on the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable, meaning those widows, women-headed households, children, migrants, indeed, who live these double vulnerabilities in a totally different way who don't have livelihoods, who have left their homes because of a reason. But again, I'm, I'm saying that it's easily sa easier said than done, hence the complementarity, the need to have states also driving, but also regional organizations to drive these changes. And us humanitarians will only be contributors to local efforts rather than driving uh, these responses, which in a way, and I worked in Iraq for, for five, six years, these are not sustainable. The, we need the, the local uh, buy-in, and then we can push and, uh, and, and, and debate and negotiate on that behalf. But I loved what I heard last time at COP26. We need African voices, for example, for Africa, that would only be the only recipe for rescue because the realities are there, and they know how to live these realities. And that brings me back to the, this notion of injustice that I mentioned at the beginning, which should hurt us all. And therefore, I think that's the way forward that I can see in front of us. Back to you, Andy. Can I jump in well, on that, Andy? Yeah, or are we going to take another? Absolutely. So we're close to the end, Andy. Yes, go for yeah, it. Just, I'm just reflecting on um, a lot of what Patrick was saying, and you know, thinking uh, of all the experiences we've had in recent history, um, or are having. COVID and climate are two that I think arguably have touched every single human on planet Earth in one way or another. Um, so on some level, it's, it's a deeply common and challenging experience we're sharing. Um, on another level, as Patrick alluded to, you know, both of these challenges have deepened already existing inequities. So we're not having the same experience of these crises. We're having very different experiences, whether we have access to the vaccine or can live safely or are on high enough ground and so forth. And that's why I think as we as we think about um, building community and about our response, we really have to be so grounded in equity as a central principle and ensuring that we empower and enable people who are the most marginalized and discriminated against to not just survive, but to thrive and to lead um, when it comes to action. And um, it's just the poorest and most marginalized people that are getting hit first, first and worst here uh, once again. And can I just jump in quickly? I mean, just to take yeah. the point of COVID, I mean, Pat, following him, Patrick, really, I mean, it's instructive. I mean, absolutely, all these similarities, but I think the experience of the, we've all gone through with COVID, I mean, it not only highlights all these challenges that are very similar, but it also, you know, it, it's it's instructive in the climate rich is, is another systemic risk and challenge, right? That it calls for all the same things, extensive cooperation across sectors, et cetera, partnerships, cooperation, et cetera, and having local voices and equity. I mean, it's, it's sort of, so I think it's a very instructive in terms of the challenges and what needs to happen in terms of this issue we're talking about here. Wow. Well, we're, we're pretty much at the end of the allotted time, which for me, again, means this is not even chapter one. This is the introduction to some conversations that we really should drive forward. I'm committed to helping do that with you as guests or others who can come in uh, on my sustain what broadcasts and, and what I write. Um, the one thing that I'd like to end these sessions on is a call to all of us to think about what can we do or our institutions do together that we just simply can't do as well individually. You know, where, what are the key gaps here? Who's not in conversation? Who can reach out to those most vulnerable? Who's working with them face-to-face -face in a way that can then connect with resources and create uh, actionable pathways? Uh, so we'll, we'll revisit those questions. Normally we would talk about them here more. Uh, so thank you all for being part of this discussion of this critical juncture between climate change, climate vulnerability, and societal change? What can we do in the social climate to help us navigate the changing geophysical climate? It's kind of what I've devoted uh, 
33 of my 65 years too, and we'll keep going on. And I know you all will be too. Thank you for being here today. I'm sure the audience shares my appreciation and the organizers. I've been asked to give a few housekeeping updates for the remainder of the day. Those registered for the full conference will continue through today on AFP's conference website with a jam-packed agenda of interactive workshops and panel conversations, exploring how we can all come together and rise to build peace amid climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, and a high and global violent conflict. And headlines every day saying there's more nigh if we don't get to work harder. For those of you not registered for the full conference, it's not too late to register, exclamation point, seriously. Just head over to the events.bizaboo.com slash peacecon, peacecon at 10 website. Bizaboo is B-I-Z-Z-A-B-O dot com. Events.bizaboo.com, peacecon at 10. Again, all are welcome back later today for the closing of day one. A fireside chat at four, featuring Robert Jenkins, USAID Admi Assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Conflict Prevention and Stabilization. And uh, do something every day to connect with somebody that relates to either a local vulnerability in your own neighborhood or vulnerability across the world and uh, keep at it. This is a long journey, but it's a hopeful one. And thank you. <laughs>